Welcome back to Proxam, everybody, and today we're going to be talking about how to play a Monster Mash Eldar list in 10th edition. So this is part of a series I've done for a while where I kind of make themed or challenge lists for you guys, and I run them on the tabletop and I tell you what I think about them. And essentially, this list is going to be all about the monsters, the Wraith Lords, the Wraith Knights, the Wraith Seers, and of course, the Avatars. This was actually supposed to come out near Halloween time. I wanted to do this as a Halloween special, but just never got the chance because I never had time to actually get some test games in with it. There was so much going on during that time, I really just didn't get the chance. But over the last month, I have had some time to try this out in some friendly games against some opponents at my local game store. So figured I'd share my results with you and go ahead and talk you guys through the list. So without further ado, let us go ahead and jump right into it. But first, a quick overview of what we're going to be doing in today's video. We're going to be talking about what a monster mash list is, the rules and restrictions of the list, and lastly, the list I made with analysis and breakdown. So what is a monster mash list? So it's basically a list using nothing but units with the monster keyword. And when I say that, I really do mean it. All walkers or vehicles that don't have the monster keyword are out. You can't use them. You can't use Phantom Titans because Phantom Titans don't have the monster keyword. And you can't use things like War Walkers because, of course, they also do not have the monster keyword. Now, traditionally, support models are also allowed in these types of lists to boost their effectiveness. You know, things like Farseers for the Fortune or Farseer Skyrunners for Guide or even Spirit Seers for a little bit extra lethal hits or just, you know, basically accuracy in general with their plus one to hit. So traditionally, those models are allowed in these types of lists, but we're going to do something a little bit different. And with our list, we're not going to include anything without the monster keyword. So if it doesn't have the monster keyword, it is not allowed. So that means no spirit seers, no far seers, solitaires, death jesters, etc. If it doesn't have that monster keyword, it is just simply not allowed. However, for those of you who do want to make a more efficient monster mash list, you can include these characters. And of course, far seers are very good inclusions, you know, lone operatives like Autark Way Leapers are also very good for those extra command points and, you know, other support abilities. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the list that I made for this challenge. Now, right off the bat, I am going to say it's not the most efficient list, and I learned this very early on. I think there could be some changes made to it to make it more efficient. And if I relaxed, you know, obviously the restrictions of the list to include support characters and so forth, I think it would be much better. Having said that, however, I did find some success with it as far as the amount of stuff it killed. It was a very durable list. A lot of opponents had trouble dealing with the twin avatars as well as, you know, other units that are in the list, which I will talk about. But in general, I do think it has some issues, which we'll go into in just a second. So this list, of course, is a Strike Force list at 2,000 points. I got it up to 1995, which is pretty close and probably as close as we're going to get with a list like this. For my characters, I have the Avatar of Kane, who is the Warlord. He has the Wailing Doom, of course, and we have the Yinkarn, of course, as well. Both of these are very strong units in their own right. They're mostly used with support, but they are good on their own, especially if they're backed up by other monsters. And what I found is actually the Avatar of Kane and the Yinkarn were kind of the powerhouses of this list. They did most of the work, whereas the other monsters just really supported them. And that's essentially because they're so scary, right? You know, Wraith Lords or Wraith Seers on their own aren't the scariest models. They can do some serious damage, but they're not super threatening to a lot of things in the game. And they're fairly easy to kill if you can draw a bead on them. But the Avatar of Kane and the Yinkarn are not so. The Yinkarn is a little bit more fragile than the Avatar of Kane, but typically the Yinkarn is going to be hiding as well and is very resistant to indirect fire. And then, of course, when you do kill something, the Yinkarn can just pop out there and absolutely brutalize your opponent. So one of the things that happened during one of my games that was super funny, actually, is I was going against an Orc player. And he's our, you know, local Orc player. He's a pretty decent player, runs a lot of Orc trucks and stuff like that. And on one of his turns, he actually had an Orc truck and a squad of knobs lined up to charge the Avatar of Cain. So what I actually did, and the truck was a little bit ahead of the boys, right? A little bit in front of them. And so what I did was I overwatched the truck, which he expected, right? Now, this was a smart move by him, but it actually ended up backfiring because I just brought the Yinkarn in and totally blocked his charge 
from being able to go off. So some of you guys might be wondering, Proxy Hammer, why did you do that? Why did you put your Yin Karn in harm's way just to have it die instead of the Avatar of Cain? Well, it was on one of the later turns of the game. He was saving that unit for an ace in the hole, and he was trying to get onto an objective. And he actually, if he had made that charge against the Avatar of Cain, he would have scored on those primary points. So that's why I used the Incarn as a sacrifice. Basically, he was unable to get to the Avatar of Cain, and because of that, he was just subsequently unable to score on that objective. The Avatar of Cain was also already damaged. He had taken some damage from some shooting earlier, so... He was within kill range, and I just didn't want that to happen, and it ended up actually winning me the game, surprisingly enough. And truth be told, it is something he forgot about, but, you know, that's, that's sometimes how it goes, right? He was going to charge the truck in anyway because he didn't want the Avatar overwatching his boys and so forth, because, you know, the Avatar's overwatch is pretty powerful. Even against Mega Knobs, it can kill quite a few of them, you know, if you actually roll good on the sustained hits. All right, so as for the other data sheets in the army, we have the Wraith Knight, of course. Now, I brought the Wraith Knight in here because it's a monster, and it just makes sense, right? Now, the Wraith Knight is much less powerful than it was before, but because of the fact that this is a monster mash list without farcers or anything like that, you have a little bit more freedom with it to do other stuff besides just, you know, sit back and shoot with heavy Wraith Cannons. So I chose to give this the Titanic Ghost Glaive. And let me tell you guys... The Titanic Ghost Glaive is an absolute monster. I ran this a couple times in the beginning of the edition, but even in the beginning of the edition, with one heavy Wraith Cannon, I felt like it was way too OP, so I stopped running it. Right now, it feels really powerful. You know, with the Wraith Cannon, it can just absolutely blow stuff up, but this thing can also be good in close combat. I had several games where I blew up a transport with this thing's heavy weapon, and then followed up with the Titanic Ghost Glaive in close combat and just wiped whatever was inside. So yeah, this thing can do a bunch of damage to enemy units, without a doubt. It's still very powerful, it's just a little bit too expensive in my mind and in the minds of a lot of players to actually field anymore. But it is still good, so you know I chose to put it in this list, and it did a lot of work. I have to say, it did a lot of work. Now, the other thing about this model that some of you guys might not kind of realize is because of its large base size, it can actually plug quite a few holes in between ruins and things like that, so enemy vehicles and other, you know, kind of bigger models can't get through. And this has actually saved me on multiple occasions because the Wraith Knight is fairly quick. It can get up the battlefield fairly quickly and block off those, you know, avenues of movement from your opponent. And this will allow you to score better on primary objectives because, quite frankly, the Wraith Lords and Wraith Seers don't have the objective control needed to hold objectives from opponents. Either they have to kill the opponent and, you know, wipe out all their models, or they're just not going to be holding those objectives. And to give you an example, two regular Space Marine Intercessors will control an objective over a Wraith Lord or a Wraith Seer. And trust me, this has happened to me because both of those models, both the Wraith Lord and Wraith Seer, don't have a great chance to hit. They hit on a 4+. plus which means that if an opponent just charges in a unit of intercessors into them, right, you're going to get your attacks, but you might not kill four models. You might only kill three on average dice. And that's kind of being generous because you're probably only going to kill two if you roll even a little bit below average, right? So with that being said, a good opponent will simply just do that and be able to score on primary objectives. Yeah, they'll lose their unit, but they're going to get those points right? So being able to block enemies off from doing that is a really good tactic to learn when using this kind of army. The list also has three Wraith Lords in it. Now, I gave the Wraith Lords all Eldari missile launchers. That's probably not the way to go. In hindsight, I probably should have realized that maybe, you know, one of them should have had Bright Lances just for that extra anti-tank, anti-large punch. Yes, the army does have some good anti-large, but it doesn't have a lot of long-ranged anti-large that can cover multiple parts of the battlefield, right? The Wraith Knight is no longer the, you know, god of the battlefield. He's no longer going to be able to just see everything on the board with his Wraith Cannons. He does have to draw a line of sight just like everything else. So having a pair of Bright Lances on something else besides the Wraith Knight is very important. Having said that, however, it did help tremendously against Hordes. I did go against a Nid Horde list, 
which I lost. I did lose that game. <laughs> Just basically got out OC'd on objectives, but, you know, he didn't really kill any of my models either. And that's why I think really the biggest problem of this list is the primary objective control that it has, which it just really lacks. However, you know, the missile launchers were effective. They did clear out a lot of enemy gaunts. Gargoyles and gaunts went down very quickly to twin missile launchers and flamers. So that was really cool. And then, of course, the sweeps in combat did sweep away a lot of them as well. But like I said before, he only needs two gaunts to be able to control that objective for me. So even with Overwatch and attacking in close combat with the sweeps, I wasn't able to kill enough Gaunts usually to be able to actually still control the objective. Which is quite unfortunate, and I do think a lot of other Eldar players, you know, typically have more elite lists. Obviously not a monster mash like I'm running now, let's be real. But you're running a lower model count list, and lower model count lists will have trouble against those Termagons. And something I've learned is that screening is still very important. Being able to deploy something in front of a unit of Gaunts so that they can't move past to get to onto the objective in the first place is a very good tactic for securing primary objectives. And I see a lot of your lists don't have rangers in them, guys. I think that has to start changing for sure. I think especially when we get nerfed in January, I think you're going to have to start leaning more into those kind of, you know, ranger units and stuff like that because your night spinners are not going to be able to prevent the movement that they did before. Well, that's my prediction anyway. I do think they are going to nerf the ability of the Night Spinner, but who knows? GW may do a lot of different things. They're not exactly transparent with what they are actually going to nerf when they, you know, state an army needs a nerf. So we'll just have to wait and see on that. But aside from that matchup against the Termagants and so forth, against the Nid Swarm, the list actually did perform against more elite armies. I did and was able to play against a Custodes player and... Won quite handily. I know Custodes are kind of in the garbage right now, but, you know, this list did perform very well against them. And I really do think that's probably because of the Avatar of Kane and Yungarn. <laughs> I have to say, I, I don't think the Wraith Lords really did much against them, but, you know, Avatar and Yungarn just absolutely slaughtered them. It wasn't even funny most of the time. And, you know, the Wraith Seers were pretty good as well. And yes, I do have two Wraith Seers in this list also. I think the Wraith Seers are awesome. But I do think for most games, they're worse than the Wraith Lord objectively. However, they did serve a really cool purpose in this list. And that is they were able to actually kind of cause some battle shock tests on a few units and make it easier for them to kill because they couldn't, you know, they could no longer be targeted by stratagems and things like that for the rest of the turn. So I actually thought these guys were pretty useful. And I did actually enjoy their ability quite a bit. Now, that is kind of a luck thing, right? They do have to take a Battleshock test. It's not a guarantee. So there were times when it did nothing. And there were other games where actually it, it did do something. Now, the other thing about the rates here that a lot of people overlook is it has some really good anti-infantry clearing potential. The sweep attacks give you 15 attacks. They're at a lower AP and a lower damage than the Ghost Glaive of the Wraith Lord, but it just absolutely slaughters Light Infantry. It's really good against Light Infantry, and the Wraith Seer also has Destructor, which is essentially the Warlock Heavy Flamer. So you do get that as well. Is it as good as two regular Flamers? No, of course not, right? The two regular Flamers are better, but the Destructor is still pretty good, and the Wraith Seer gets the Wraith Seer D Cannon. Which is pretty powerful. It's a high strength shot, but it is low range. And that's something I did, unfortunately, kind of see throughout the games that the Wraith Cannon on this thing was just not that good. Or I should say the D Cannon, right? It wasn't as good as a normal D Cannon. It's much worse. It has, it, you know, it doesn't have the heavy keyword. It doesn't have the plus two damage. So unfortunately, it is quite a bit weaker, and I was considering swapping it with a Bright Lance to make it a little bit more efficient, which I think would have been better for things like Overwatch, right? Because even though the Wraith Cannon, or I should say the D Cannon, it feels like a Wraith Cannon because it's so weak, but the D Cannon on the Wraiths here is pretty powerful. You know, Strength 14, AP minus 4 is good. It only has D6 damage. And when you're shooting it at things coming in, you know, like Tyranid monsters or anything trying to get to onto an objective to support the Gaunts that are already probably swarming around you, it's just not going to do as much. It's not going to hit as hard as that Bright Lance. And sometimes you do want that extra range to hit something downfield. So I think 
you know, in the future, I'll probably take Bright Lances on this thing, even though the Wraith Seer Decanon is really cool. Okay, so now that we've kind of gone through the list, what are my thoughts on it and what are the areas of improvement? So I talked a little bit about what I would have done. I would have definitely swapped one of the Wraith Lords missile launchers for Bright Lances, as the list was a bit low on ranged anti-large. And the missile launchers, while they can deal with anti-large, they're not really good at it. They have a lower AP value, which means opponents are probably going to get a 4 plus save against it. And typically, they don't do much against heavier targets. And also, I already had two Wraith Lords in the list with the missile launchers, and I just think the third one was typically in the background anyway in the backfield. So swapping it with Bright Lances wouldn't really hurt it at all. I would have also given Bright Lances to the Wraith Seers just because the Wraith Seer D cannon was super short ranged, and there were times where it actually came up to where the range actually did hurt it, and I wasn't able to shoot it at the target I wanted to. And basically what would happen was my opponent would pop something out, you know, into, you know, one of my firing lanes to be able to shoot at either the Wraith Knight, the Avatar of Cain, or something like that with their anti-tank. They would shoot. And then in my turn, when I would measure the range for my Wraiths here, I found out that, oh, look, it's not in range. It's barely out by like a couple inches. So yeah, I could have moved, but that would have moved me off the objective and I wouldn't have been able to hold that objective. So I do think Bright Lances are probably just, in most cases, at least in this list, the better option for the Wraiths here. The Wraith Knight was absolutely perfect when it didn't die, and there were times where I did move it in. I would blow up a transport. I'd slaughter the unit inside. One of the best examples of this was actually my buddy who ran a unit of Terminators inside of a Land Raider and actually did something really kind of beast is basically moved up dropped his terminators off and just slaughtered a wraith lord on an objective and then moved on top of the objective and claimed it so you know my wraith knight came in blew up the land raider with some really good rolling so you know between fate dice and the re-rolls that the wraith knight gets and also i got a few devastating wounds which was awesome right that usually doesn't happen but i rolled hot and i got him blew up the land raider and then the Wraith Knight charged into the Terminators and killed every single one of them between the Star Cannons and, you know, because I fired the Star Cannons at them before I went in. And then the Titanic Ghost Glaive, the Terminators were absolutely destroyed. And I was able to reclaim the objective, which was really cool. So it was a really cinematic moment. And, you know, he spent a lot of points trying to kill that Wraith Lord and get onto the objective. And then, you know, of course, the Wraith Knight just came in and absolutely cleaned up. So that was really cool. So the Wraith Knight is still good. Obviously, is it super competitive anymore? No, probably not. But between you and me, guys, if they hadn't nerfed the Wraith Knight's points, I still think people would probably run it in competitive play. Not so much. I don't think you would have seen it in every list, but I think it would be a niche pick that some people would actually play. And that's just because this thing is very tough. So I think if it was cheaper, I think people would actually, you know, play it more and stuff. And, and you might see some different builds with it. Unfortunately, GW killed it, put it at an insane point cost. So unfortunately, we won't be seeing that. But it is, it is pretty good, and it was just absolutely perfect in this list. So in conclusion, this list was a fun list. It was super fun to play, but it did struggle a lot on objectives in a big way. And it was really more of a meme list than anything else. I know it doesn't seem like, you know, somebody like me would just run a bunch of memes and stuff like that in games, but it kind of was, and it did feel like a meme list. You know, usually most of the lists I make, I try to make them, you know, at least semi-competitive, even if they're a themed list. You know, like when I made the Mechdar list or the Aspect Assault list and things like that or the Wraith Guard list, all of those lists were not meme lists. They were themed, but they weren't memes, right? This list actually did feel like a meme just because when I looked at it, it was just a bunch of different monsters on the field. It looked funny. People laughed at it when they saw it, you know, and basically, yeah, I felt like it was a meme and basically a lot of its power came from its ability to kill enemies but also that the list was really tough. And if players didn't have enough anti-large to deal with it, often that would give me a huge advantage in the game. And I could afford to do secondary objectives with my other models. You know, my Wraith Lords in the backfield, you know, I have one on each side and stuff like that so I can get table corners and so forth, right? I can score high because my opponent's not killing anything. 
So I have the leeway of being able to score different secondary objectives and also keep control of primaries. However, if my opponent was playing the objective game with a bunch of swarms or my opponent had enough anti-large, I often found myself on the losing end, losing way too much to be able to compete on the objective game. And, you know, even though, you know, killing wise, we killed about the same amount of points from each other and traded very efficiently with each other, I just didn't have the objective control to win. And as such, a lot of my games ended up being one-sided in the objective arena. So against that NID player that I told you about, yeah, I scored points, but my NID opponent scored way more. My NID opponent almost scored, I hate to say it, he almost scored 100 points. <laughs> Just because he maxed his secondaries, he almost maxed his primaries. And, you know, I was scoring at about 70 points, and I figured that was good for what I could do, right? But... I just really had a hard time in the primary game, you know? I mean, I must have killed hundreds of Gaunts by the end of that battle, but regardless, at the end of each turn, those Gaunts were on the objective, and I could not take it away from them. So, unfortunately, I lost that game pretty bad, but, you know, there were other games against more elite armies that this army did do better against. Now, I do think this list can be optimized if you want to do a little bit more with it. So, if you do want to take more in the way of support... Farseers would be very good. A couple of Farseers in this list, like for example, if I got rid of the Wraith Knight and I just said, okay, the Wraith Knight's out, or I got rid of one of my Wraith Lords and I chose to just plug in two Farseers on foot into the list, or a Farseer Skyrunner, or an Autark Wayleaper, and a Farseer on foot, I think that would have been a much needed inclusion to make it more effective. Because the Farseers can obviously make one of them tougher. So if I really need a really super tough Avatar of Cain one turn to be able to hold an objective, then I can do that because I have fortune, right? So there are ways to make this list a little bit better. I just chose not to do it because I'm an idiot. <laughs> Basically, I'm just wacky and I just wanted to make it so that, you know, I only had monsters in the list. But, you know, most importantly, it was super fun. And again, I know I've said this before, but the list was truly fun to play. And it was funny to play. I had a great time playing this list. It may have been a bit of a meme, but it was awesome. <laughs> and I couldn't recommend it more. For those of you guys who do have the models to play it, I would highly recommend trying it out. It may just surprise you. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching, and thank you so much to all my patrons and supporters who have supported the channel over the last year. Your help has greatly improved the channel and helped it grow significantly. If you do want to become a Patreon member, I have free trials activated, which will grant you permanent access to our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who love talking about strategy, tactics, and, of course, hobby. I will leave the link for that in the description below. I also have a channel store page, Ammon and Amazon Affiliate, so if you want to grab some discounted Eldar miniatures on Amazon, or you want to pick up some Eldar-inspired apparel on my channel store page, I will leave the links for that in the description also. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today. Peace out, and see you guys in the next video. Have a good one, everybody. See you later.